uh, and um, welcome everybody who's logged in. Welcome my speakers. Um, this is the first of a series uh, that so far has the following date set, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, today we have a great group of panelists. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Guxel uh, from Istanbul. We have Dr. Oren Friedman uh, from uh, Philadelphia. We have Dr. Fausto Lopez Uloa from Mexico, and Dr. Uh, Carlos Neves and Miguel Ferreira uh, from Portugal. And all of these folks are uh, experts in preservation rhinoplasty, and I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to host them today. And uh, I'm just going to uh, start with a little bit of an introduction and to talk a little bit about my experience with it, which has been just over a year now that I've actually started uh, working with this, uh, and then turn it over to our panelists to go through some cases. Uh, and uh, let's see how this goes. Okay, so um, for me, I, I'm a person who was trained in structural rhinoplasty, uh, very much a disciple of the things that uh, Dean Toriumi and others have taught me over the years and my mentors. Uh, and um, what, what really strikes me about preservation rhinoplasty is the way that we can preserve the osteocartilaginous vault. And I watched people like Fausto and, and others talk about this for many years. Uh, and this is just a basic introduction for the people, the audience who may not be as familiar with it before our speakers launch into their uh, various methods. Um, so basically, I'm going to get this out of the way here. With preservation rhinoplasty, we're talking about dorsal preservation here, and now preservation rhinoplasty means a lot of different things to different people, but we're talking about osteocartilaginous vault preservation, and that's something that's been around for over 100 years. Uh, and uh, this technique, Let's see if this advances here. There we go. Is essentially uh, one of two different ways of addressing the bony vault, which is either a letdown or a pushdown. A pushdown, essentially there's no resection of the vault and the entire thing is pushed in. And with a letdown procedure, there's actually a small resection of varying size in the area of Webster's triangle to allow the, uh, the bony vault to sort of be let down into position. I think that the term letdown is unfortunate because it sounds like it's a disappointment or something. I actually mentioned that the other day in front of a patient said, I, I think we'll do a letdown procedure. And she thought that meant it was going to be a disappointing procedure. So I think maybe if we came up with a different name, that would be better. But the major ways that things differ uh, in terms of the different uh, dorsal preservation techniques, and I think you'll see that today, is the way the septum is addressed. Uh, and I'm excited to have our speakers talk about their various methods. Maurice Cottle in the mid 20th century was one of the major proponents of uh, this method of dorsal preservation. And his method of septal, uh, uh, addressing the septum with this was as follows, with dual resections dorsally and inferiorly and rotation of the entire septum into position. And this is uh, from actually Dr. Guxel's workshop in 2019, which by the way is a fantastic course. For anybody who wants to go, I think he's going to have it again next year. Um, this uh, is a video from a dissection done there. Let's see if the video plays. There we go. And this just shows how that septum rotates forward and how the entire dorsum uh, sort of rotates down into position. One thing to keep an eye on is the way at the, you can get some notching up here at the top. Uh, and so that's one of the problems that I think we address uh, with, bony, uh, with the bony cuts. Yves Saban, uh, more recently uh, pictured here uh, with me actually at uh, Dr. Guxel's meeting uh, with Boris Chekir, uh, is a proponent of a resection of the septum as follows, where essentially it's a subdorsal, high subdorsal strip resection. And uh, with this, you actually have a little bit more control, I think, of how you drop the dorsum and it's less destabilizing. And this really looked great. He does this primarily endonasally. And I've been watching uh, my friends talk about this for a few years and thinking about this problem because for me, I've trained and believe in structural rhinoplasty. Um, and I thought to myself, how do I reconcile this with preservation rhinoplasty approaches, many of which were endonasal. Um, and I wondered if there's a way to combine the two. Uh, and one of the things that was really revelatory for me was beginning to use the piezo uh, with an open approach and fully exposing the bony vault uh, and that's something that Olivier Gerbeau uh, really popularized for us a few years ago. 
Uh, and I think doing that allowed me to feel I had more control and decide to start approaching uh, the dorsum uh, with a preservation method while combining it with structural techniques. Uh, and this was published recently. Um, and so uh, this, the way that I've started approaching this for now about a year, uh, just over a year, is to do a subdorsal four to five millimeter strip that we preserve and then resect below this. And a flexible cut in the dorsal segment is made, uh, has been proposed previously by uh, Fausto Lopez Uloa and others to allow this to flex down and osteotomy superiorly as a standard and the entire segment flexes down into position. What I like about this is it allows me to have control of this tripod tip complex, allows me to take out some septum if I need to by preserving this T-strut, uh, and then allows me to do the things that I've been trained to do to make that tip tripod complex the way I want it. Uh, and so uh, this structural approach, and I call this a modified sub, uh, subdorsal septal approach, uh, is like that. And so in a cross section, if you look at, at this, the resection looks something like this as you drop it into position. And looking at the different methods, uh, the caudal method, Saban method, and the way that I do it, and looking at the red areas is where we resect bone or cartilage, everything drops into position similarly, but there are different ways of getting there. And I think it's about what you're most comfortable with. And I just want to say that last year uh, with uh, Guxel as our captain on our boat, uh, that he arranged after his meeting. I had really great discussions with a lot of different people and discovered that Carlos, who's going to talk about this, uh, Dr. Nevis, has something very similar that he does, a little bit different, but it, he calls it the Tetris concept. I'm excited to hear and invited him to speak about that as well, and he's published on this as well, so I just want to make sure I acknowledge that. But this is what it looks like. So for me, preserving this caudal segment is very important because my tongue and groove techniques and other things depend on it. And we resect a portion of the septum, like so, preserving that subdorsal strip. And then this segment is flexible, as you can see. You can uh, actually move it up and down. And then you suture into position with a PDS suture. This segment right here, if my arrow is showing, uh, this is showing a profile view, is then adjusted towards the end, but this is a solid segment that allows us to do other things. And I'm a big proponent of tongue and groove and ailer spanning sutures and other things to address the tip tripod complex. And this allows me to do that. So here's a case example. Uh, this is a patient who has a number of different challenges uh, with her nose, I think with any approach. Um, and they are the low radix, which in some cases would be a contraindication to trying this uh, method. Uh, asymmetry of her bony vault. You can see the, the bony and cartilaginous vault is deviated to her left. She has thick skin uh, in the tip of her nose. It's also asymmetric. It's also very totic. She has a wide tip and she has very poor tip support. So this is a prime candidate for, for me doing techniques to rotate and adjust that tip into position using structural methods. And I wanted to combine that. So for her, she had actually a push down because she only needed a small amount of uh, reduction of her dorsum uh, with a modified subdorsal strip method. I used the other techniques that I've used for my entire career, such as tongue and groove, uh, recently more, uh, more recently mini lateral curl strut grafting, ailer spanning sutures, and other techniques in the tip to get the tip the shape that we wanted. This is not this patient, but this is just showing a quick video of the cartilaginous uh, portion of this type of procedure. This part. So this is the video showing this uh, cartilaginous portion of the procedure. This isn't that patient. Um, and so we make our cartilaginous cuts preserving that subdorsal strip. I think that one thing that's helpful for making that vertical cut, this is the cartilage being removed here, so no bone's been removed yet. And using a needle to make sure you want to make your cut right at that major flexion point, and you can make two cuts if you need to. Uh, and then you notice there I use a scissor to make a small cut and very judicious removal of bone. And this is something that uh, Dr. Guxel has uh, taught me and others that very, be very careful with that bony reduction because uh, that you can always do incrementally. And sometimes you don't need any bony reduction because you don't want to get a step off up high. Uh, the osteotomy you saw there percutaneously, and this is using the 4 PDS to adjust uh, that height. And then you can also place one, uh, didn't in this patient or didn't video it, 
uh, in the mid dorsum area to attach it to the septal strip below. And so it looks something like this with our sutures in place. And so here she is one week post-op. I have a series of photos for her. Here she is uh, four months post-op. And she, here she is very recently, just this week coming to see me and you notice in the COVID era, she uh, didn't have uh, as much makeup or eyelashes on, but that's probably better for, for the photographs to really just see what's happened with the nasal form. You can see the tip support is much improved. Three quarters view at one week, four months, nine months, uh, one week frontal view, four months, uh, and then nine months. And this is a close-up frontal view, that tip form. This is the type of tip form we want to see. This is a thick skin patient. You can see the improved symmetry as well. Uh, and then on the base view, you can see the improvement. This is really key, I think. This is four months, and this is nine months. And uh, again, open approach, incision is really very invisible. There's a close-up of that. Um, I like to now show uh, the, the functional anesthetic uh, scores for my patients using the Schnaz pre-op. These are her scores. You can see the cosmetic scores on the bottom are the problem, and they all go down uh, at nine months to very low. So she's having no functional or aesthetic issues. Just another quick patient, really fast, uh, showing uh, another way we can use structural techniques, lateral curl overlay in this place to really rotate that tip into the position that I want, modified subdorsal strip method, same type of thing. She has a small residual bump right here, but it's okay. Uh, she has good tip form and the rotation and structure of that tip is done using structural techniques that I'm more comfortable with. And these are her uh, schnauz scores before and after, a little bit of stuffiness probably due to allergies in the post-op. So just to summarize and turn it over to my, to my speakers, um, there are different methods uh, for addressing the bony vault, primarily two, but many different ways of addressing the septum. Our speakers have different ways of doing that and I'm excited to hear about them. There's some overlap in the way we do things. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, for me, combining structural approaches, which is what I've done, uh, and preservation allows me to do what I call a structural preservation rhinoplasty, meaning more preservation of the dorsal uh, osseocartilaginous vault uh, using this modified subdorsal uh, strip approach or method. And you can do SEG, uh, tongue and groove, lateral curl strut grafting, lateral curl overlay, ailer spanning sutures, all the types of things that that uh, we've been trained in uh, as open structure rhinoplasty surgeons at the same time. So I think it's very useful to have this tool uh, to do this. And I uh, just wanna uh, now turn it over to my speakers. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And I'm sorry about that glitch <laughs> with the uh, partial blockage of the video. Hopefully the point still got across. Um, and so now we're gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Guxel, who's going to talk to us about his approach and an illustrative case. So let's turn the screen over. You're muted, uh, Guxel. Guxel, mute. you're muted. Okay, now it's okay. okay. I think you can hear me now. First of all, I want to thank Sam uh, for his kind invitation. It's Great honor for me to be here with you friends and share my knowledge. And I'm going to present one case. I didn't choose a complicated case. I chose actually a simple case because there are some surgeons who has experienced about preservation rhinoplasty, but most of the audience, maybe they don't have any experience. And I chose this easy case for not showing tricky things, for showing that it, there is possibility to preserve something more and more and make some better healing and getting really good results. So the first of all, Sam mentioned about my course in Istanbul. Uh, I organize the course every two years, but next year we skip the course and it will be on 2021. Oh, yeah, to 2022, because 2021, we decided to create another course with Dr. Dean Toriumi and Rolin Daniel. Uh, they are the presidents, and Dr. Boris Chakr and me, we are the chairman. So the title is Structural Preservation Rhinoplasty. 
I think it will be a really interesting course for all of us. So the case is easy case. Why it's easy? Because usually when we call it easy case, we struggle in the operation theater because we underestimate this case. But usually we call this kind of case when they come to our clinic in our office, we call it easy case because she just need a small tip plasty uh, and pump reduction. As you see, the dorsal aesthetic lines are good. The main in preservation rhinoplasty as in all tech techniques, choosing the correct candidate for the preservation rhinoplasty. So there are different types of preservation rhinoplasty techniques, depends on the septum work, depends on the dorsum work, depends on the modification of the dorsal aesthetic lines. But this kind of cases, you don't need to change anything on the dorsum. So dorsal, dorsal aesthetic lines are fine. Hump is less than four millimeter and mostly cartilaginous hump. Then I can preserve as much as possible in such kind of cases. Uh, I educated also in structural way. So I do structural rhinoplasty, 50% of my cases. I do still structural rhinoplasty. And I combine structural rhinoplasty with preservation rhinoplasty. It's not just about the dorsum preservation, actually. It's about preserving the ligaments, preserving the skin attachment, preserving the tip support, and preserving the dorsum, of course. So this is the case. I made a plan not to dissect anything on the dorsum. So skin attachment was intact. I didn't touch to the skin and the, uh, to the skin on the dorsum. The red line, the red marked area is dissected area. So I opened the tip because I like to do open approach. I feel comfortable with open approach on tip, tip plasty mostly. I want to see my tip on the midline. Then I created my tunnel exactly through the preform aperture and lower than the nasomaxillary suture line. So there is also small attachment on the nasomaxillary suture line. I call it nasomaxillary suture line ligament. So I start usually with hemitransfection incision because I don't need to undermine anything on columella, first of all. So I will keep uh, the ligaments intact. This is the approach. Sam mentioned about the high septal strip. It's Yves Saban's modification. Uh, that's how I learned this preservation rhinoplasty. I started with high septal strip. I think it's really easy way to learn, easy way to start. But some cases you need to do more, some cases Cuttle works bad, bad, better, especially in, on crooked nose. And a lot of modifications, Sam's modification, uh, Carlos' modification, Miguel's modification, they work really nice. But once you choose the correct candidate, you have to get the correct tool from your toolbox. So this tool is the easiest one to start from my point of view. You're just taking out the strip immediately under the dorsal hump, then creating your Osteotomy is low to low on the facial groove and transverse osteotomy and radix osteotomy. Then you can choose push down or let down. Usually we do let down because I like to excise a small piece of the bone from the Webster triangle, not to overlap with the inferior turbinate bony fragment. So this is the approach I did on the septum through the hemitransfixion incision. And there is another question people ask usually, uh, the dissection plane, subperichondrially or supraperichondrially. For me, one of them works nice, but I prefer to do subperichondrial dissection for extremely thin skin patients because perichondrium uh, allows us to create one more layer as a camouflage. And the second, very thick skin patients, I don't like to damage the CMS for not having a swelling after the surgery. This is supraperichondrial dissection. I have a small trick how not to have any bleeding while you are doing supraperichondrial dissection. I put my hook close to the dissection area and I tent the skin. As you see, I'm just opening the first compartment, ailer compartment. This is the deep layer of the pitangi, it's intact. So I don't harm the deep layer of pitangi ligament and also scroll attachment here. As you see, scroll is intact. So 
I approach the preform of aperture. I create my tunnel for piezo osteotomy. Yeah, this is the video. You can see how I use my piezo because piezo creates heat. It, it, it heats the tissue. So you don't have to touch the skin. You need a tunnel, a large tunnel to use piezo. So through this tunnel, I can use still my piezo insert without touching the skin. I don't damage anything. And up to medial contour ligament line, I dissect and create my tunnel. So all the skin is intact. I didn't do any dissection on the dorsum. This is the way I use my piezo sagittally because I don't want any resistance. Uh, the most common complication in this technique is residual hump. We call it spring effect. So we, do, we have to do a lot of things. This is the case presentation. That's why I'm not going to present all these tricks. And this case, I chose hand sew. This is Aaron Tashtan from Ankara and Baris Checker's design uh, for transverse osteotomy because I cannot do it with piezo here. My tunnel is a little bit tight on this region because I didn't undermine anything on the radix on purpose. Because if you undermine on the radix area, you can create some step, then you have to undermine all the skin all the way to radix. So this is the transverse osteotomy with hand sew. It's also precise cut. It works really nice. Little bit longer than piezo, but works. This is the transverse cut. And for the radix osteotomy, this particular case, I chose external two millimeter osteotomy because I cannot use piezo because there is no dissection on the skin, on the dorsum. And this is the ballerina maneuver. Mostly 80, 90% of my cases, I add this maneuver. I will, I will show you why, because who is watching first time in my presentation, they will not understand what I'm, what I'm doing. What is ballerina maneuver? Because this is the side wall dissection. This is the excision of the Webster here. And this is the preform aperture. And this is the preform ligament here. Then I dissect and make relaxation to the piriform ligament. This is the cadaver dissection. I just want to make it clear what is ballerina maneuver. As you see, once we make push down, the shape of the nose doesn't change. You can make it more, but the shape is still the same. You cannot make it flat easily. So ballerina maneuver lets us to make it flat. It's, like, it's kind of flattening maneuver. I just dissect the side wall, not, keystone, uh, not dorsal keystone area, just the lateral keystone area. I don't cut the cartilage. It's just the smooth dissection. Once you push down or let down, the shape of the dorsum changes because this is three-dimensional anatomy here. If you don't make anything on the side wall, you cannot create flat or curved dorsum. Let's continue to the case. This is the external osteotomy step. As you see, I touch the forehead. So it's oblique way because I want to create hinge. If you do perpendicular, you can create step. But if you do oblique way, you can create hinge and you don't feel any step on the red radix. And skin is untouched. I didn't dissect skin. I just create the tunnel and I just open the first ailer compartment and all the ligaments preserved. preserved. And for the tip plasty, as you see, I open the first compartment. Then this is the subperichondrial dissection I do exactly on the level of the cephalic trim area. Why? Because the scroll ligament fibers attached also to lower lateral cartilage. And actually, they are not attaching to the cartilage. They are attaching to the perichondrium. If you go under the perichondrium, you can keep intact all these attachments. So for preserving all the fibers of the scroll, I go under the perichondrium, exactly on the level of the cephalic trim. Then I did structure rhinoplasty on the tip. So I still can use lateral cross strut graft. I stole from the lateral, the columnar strut I put. And this additionally, I like to use my uh, own modification. This is from the cephalic trim. So I call it double dome graft. So it gives really nice lightening on the tip of the nose. 
this is the end of the surgery and the tapes. So what I had, this is early video, pre and post-op. There is no swelling on the dorsum because there, were, there was no dissection on the dorsum. Only one disadvantage I can say, the tip of the nose swells more than the dorsum because there is a dissection here, but it takes one to two, two months, not more. So if you inform your patient uh, pre-operative period, it doesn't make any problem. This is from the top and from the side. So this is the easy case we call usually in our daily life. So for such kind of cases without skin dissection, preservation rhinoplasty, open approach with PSO works nice on my, in my hand. So you are all welcome to Istanbul in 2021, next year's structure preservation rhinoplasty meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guxel. That was, as usual, a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation, and I, and I learned things from you. Um, a few, you so. I have a couple of questions, and some of the other folks might have some questions. Um, the the ballerina maneuver, you go all the way up to the to the to the to the dorsal keystone area. You stop there. Actually, I stop on the dorsal dor, dor, dorsal line. Uh, the easy way to stop uh, to find the stopping point. You can draw the line, the hump you want to make reduction. Mm -hmm. Then that line shows you the dangerous point. But usually, if the hump is not big, as this, this case, the small dissection can be really enough. It's just a little bit disarticulation. Mm -hmm. There is an overlapping point on the side wall. Actually, the uh, upper lateral cartilage overlaps with the nasal bones on, on the side. So you're not creating any empty space. It's just uh, working like hinge this way. Do you think it heals pretty well back into position? And I know people have asked about whether this is good. Yeah, on, only one case I have to mention, if the upper lateral cartilage uh, has concave shape, and if you undermine, you can create some problem. But uh, usually, mostly in the population, we don't have a concave shape upper lateral cartilage, but we have, we have to be careful. If the upper lateral, uh, upper lateral cartilage has concave shape, better not to do ballerina maneuver. Right, and so that was to be my next question. Which cases do you decide not to do it? Small humps or ones where you don't need much flexion or where they're concave? Small humps usually, you can, you can try first. Mm -hmm. If you feel the resistant point, if you feel that the hump uh, shape is not changing, it's, it's still kifotic. So better to do additional relaxation maneuvers. So the first maneuver I do, ballerina maneuver. Great. I have uh, I have one comment on the same same point. You know, classically we learn that separation of the upper lateral cartilages from the nasal bones leads to inverted V deformity. So I think um, that's a question that I'm sure many of the participants uh, have, and you've answered it. Uh, but uh, I think that in particular in, in thin skin patients, need, I would suggest we have to be cautious with that maneuver for fear of developing inverted V. What do you think, uh, Guxel? You're totally right. Everybody asks a similar question, actually. Uh, I have a lot of experience in, on this maneuver. Uh, first of all, I have to say that preservation rhinoplasty techniques are totally different than the conventional rhinoplasty which we have got used. So some maneuvers we don't have to do uh, in structure rhinoplasty, but this technique is preserving a lot, but I cannot say that it's less traumatic. Some, sometimes it's also traumatic, but we are preserving something uh, on the dorsum. And on these cases, we preserve the attachment between the upper lateral cartilage and the nasal bones. So it protects us to get inverted V, first of all. But some other techniques like Miguel, Mi Mi Miguel is separating to totally from the nasal bone. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have any complication. I'm just separating on the side and I'm keeping intact the dorsal part. Yeah, I have the answer for that, Arin. Uh, I learned it from Goxel and from Miguel and also from Jose Carlos. And I was thinking about it, uh, the inverted B, why, why you should release that part. But the, the key is that uh, dorsal is preserved and the, and the septum and the upper lateral cartilage, you are not modifying that part. So 
you won't have the, the mm, collapse of, of the upper lateral cartilage because it's intact the the joint with with the septum yeah and Make another sense. another thing on the uh, thank you fausto and another important thing uh, on the preform apertura there, there's a preform ligament a long long longitudinal one longitudinal preform ligament is just a, a weak ligament so there is already some weakness on the sidewall and the trick is not to cut that ligament it's just a separation it's just a relaxation if you make it relax it moves nicely if you don't do it you cannot deal for every cases i have one I, question from the audience I I just wanna... oh yeah go ahead miguel go ahead no just uh, no, the same. Oh, okay uh well we do Sorry. it's our technique we we do we have so far more than 500 patients completely uh, end capping the bone dorsal keystone area lateral keystone area. i will talk about that in my lecture and okay. we didn't have a single problem about that because you do as goxel is saying you do as far as you need you just release you feel what happened with the hand and in my technique i don't know the others i have no experience in my technique we have the support of the septum the straight support them right in the middle so the shape of the, the, the upper lateral cartilage is exactly the same, but leveled out. You are just releasing something. And it's one of the reasons why I choose my technique. And I, I will show you how, but there's, there's no danger to do that step. It's, it heals just and, normally. And last, last thing I want to mention. Uh, in structural rhinoplasty education, it's forbidden to use your osteotomes sagittally. It's because you, you can create some collapse, so there can be some step. But especially on this technique, on purpose, I do use sagittally because I want to overlap the board. So this is to totally a different philosophy. I just want to ask one quick question that came from the audience. Um, for Guxel, after the subperichondral dissection at the level of the cephalic rim and performing tip plasty, do you resuture the perichondrium? No. Okay, that was one of the questions from the, one of the attendees. Okay, I think uh, Carlos, did you have a question? Or a no, no, no. I just wanted no, no, no. I just wanted to add something to the discussion because okay. uh, uh, Guxel's uh, ballerina maneuver is more or less the same thing I've been doing for years and. And what, what, what Coxell was saying is that if you release the lower part of the upper laterals, you are not interfering with the dorsal aesthetic line. Right. Because you are keeping intact the, the upper attachment in between bone and upper lateral. So the inverted V is a problem here. It's not a problem there, down there. And we keep intact the upper part. So you never have an inverted V. It's impossible. Or you did that everything. It's completely different from Miguel. The Miguel's technique is even if different. He also doesn't have problems, but based in other concepts. But uh, this lateral uh, disarticulation is based on just the lower part is detached to, you know, just to do right. this <clears throat> open maneuver. Right, Goxel, do you agree and, with me? And, and yeah. the way Miguel does it makes sense to me, and I'll maybe comment on it afterwards, but I understand why he's yeah. also... It's yeah. a different yeah. concept, yeah. Miguel. The also dorsal part is staying complete. intact. If you cut the upper lats and they fall in, that's, and detached, I think it's more of a problem. I think we should probably move on. So, right. um, uh, Oren, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so congratulations, Sam, and uh, all the other presenters. Thank you for including me in this. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the endonasal preservation technique that I use, which is a combination of push down and let down, as we've mentioned already somewhat, uh, and it's specifically the coddle technique. So uh, this is certainly an exciting topic, and Roland Daniel has already been mentioned here. Uh, but in this uh, article in 2019, he wrote that preservation rhinoplasty is a new chapter in rhinoplasty history. Uh, the term was coined in 2018 and represents a fundamental change in philosophy. So it's interesting to dissect this statement a little bit, because uh, as we know, uh, 
actually uh, preservation rhinoplasty concepts and techniques have a much longer record than, uh, than 2018. Yes, the term preservation was coined in 2018. Uh, but the techniques are old, long-standing, and tried and true, and so we can all feel comfortable performing them, knowing that surgeons have been doing them for a while. Foundations of Modern Rhinoplasty, we think of Jacques Joseph uh, living in Berlin and operating uh, on many, many facial uh, surgeries subsequent to traumas associated with World War I. Uh, and he is credited with being the modern-day uh, rhinoplasty father, having written this book, uh, and produced a lot of excellent results uh, with these techniques. And the techniques that he specifically spoke about were reducing the dorsum from above. So with uh, osteotome and with uh, RASP potentially, uh, if today we use piezo for these purposes, uh, that certainly works as well, but the same concept, bringing it down from above. Many of these uh, outcomes we know turned out beautifully. We all have excellent uh, uh, outcomes that we can demonstrate uh, with a reduction utilizing the Joseph technique. But this particular patient demonstrates for us when some things can go wrong utilizing that technique of uh, dorsal reduction from above. So we can see, in fact, inverted V deformity with an outline of the nasal bones. We can start seeing the saddle nose deformity on the uh, three-quarter view and more demonstrated on the uh, profile view and of course, ALAR retraction. So these are some common problems that could arise from uh, overaggressive resections uh, utilizing that Joseph technique, and they require reconstructive rhinoplasty to piece things back together. Maurice Cottle recognized some of these problems. Uh, he's a famous Chicago rhinoplasty surgeon who lived up until 1982, and he's the one who really popularized the push-down technique uh, in 1954 when he published on that through the endonasal uh, technique. So at that point, there became a philosophical divergence with the emergence of two schools, the Joseph School and the Cottle School. And around the world, there were surgeons, very excellent surgeons, uh, who took both techniques to heart. The large globe in the image here demonstrates the Joseph School. But all throughout these 70 plus years, the Cottle School here in this very small planet uh, in outer space continued to do this operation. Uh, and really, actually in some senses, they were thought of as aliens while they were doing this operation. But they existed. These surgeons were doing it around the world for many, many decades. And in fact, generations of surgeons uh, were produced who grew up doing this operation. My teachers in the Cottle Technique are these two funny looking young guys. Uh, this is Fausto, who you see live on this uh, screen, on this talk here. And Jose Juan Montes Burkini is another student of Fausto Sr., uh, who in turn was also a good friend and mentor to my mentor, Gene Kern. Uh, so since I started doing rhinoplasty, uh, I learned how to do these techniques alongside all the structural techniques that we were doing. Um, and that we're speaking about, including Joseph techniques. And what Maurice Cottle really brought is the expression, as the septum goes, so goes the nose. And the septum is absolutely the central and key component to rhinoplasty in the Cottle technique, in the technique that, uh, that I took on. Uh, as proof of that, uh, Maurice Cottle is the scientist or the surgeon credited with uh, numbering the septum with these different numbers. And these areas are caudal area one, two, three, four, and five. And these areas are good for communication when we try to explain to each other uh, where the area of obstruction is in the nose as we try to appropriately correct the patient's problem uh, to give an improvement in nasal breathing. So caudal area one is the vestibule, two is the valve, three is the attic, three are the turbinates, and five is the coena. So what are the general concepts of the push down and the let down technique? So for the push down technique, we are going to do a major septal surgery, and then we're gonna push down, meaning bring the nasal bones as seen here, do our osteotomy and push those nasal bones into the nasal airway. And this illustration gives a good understanding for what one of the problems is with the push down technique. And that is 
bones that are obstructive of the nasal airway can result from this operation and in that way narrow the nasal airway. Here's an example of, um, of that uh, surgical technique. And this works best for patients who have really, really short nasal bones. This is a revision surgical operation. Uh, I was contemplating possibly doing it externally, but at the end, we did not need to do it that way. Uh, we do our septal work, which involves uh, major uh, resections of septal cartilage uh, on both sides of the nose. We're making our pockets. We create total freedom of mobility. Adam Honeybrook was my fellow. I thank him. I know he's on this, uh, this web, uh, this, this course right now. So thanks, Adam. Uh, he made this video for me. I was operating. Uh, so we're transecting. I always use a double action scissor to cut the bone. And then I remove the large segment of obstructive uh, bony septum in this case. You can see the curvature. And then we turn to uh, creating our osteotomy tunnels. So tunnels are created with a caudal elevator on either side and we don't need to remove bone. We're just doing the osteotomies. Again, the patient had very short nasal bones. So just so a push down is not going to negatively impact the airway when the bones are so short. And we can easily push the remainder of the cartilage, uh, cartilaginous septum down from below as we do with the caudal technique. Um, here's an example of that patient, of a similar patient. The letdown technique, as was alluded to, in addition to taking the septal strip, we are taking a segment of bone from the lateral nasal bone area. And that allows us to let down the bony portions so that the bones are not pushed into the airway causing obstruction. So that's the solution to that problem of airway obstruction following uh, the push down technique. And here's, an ex here's a demonstration visually through the illustration of how we uh, bring down the septal cartilage to allow the entire nose uh, to be impacted. I'm sure you'll see this slide. This is from Fausto uh, in his talk. This is what happens to the cartilage remnant. So the uh, residual anterior uh, septum is brought down at the rhinion. It's brought anteriorly uh, along the ventral remnant and anteriorly and superiorly at the caudal remnant. Here's an example of a patient who underwent the, um, uh, the letdown technique. So I'm just gonna go forward. Again, the septal work is done. We then take whatever bony portion, and I leave the ventral intact, although I disarticulate it from the maxillary crest, and leave as a last step for a section of the uh, inferior strip. We take out the posterior septal cartilage and whatever bony portions need to be removed in order to give an excellent correction of the airway through an excellent and aggressive septoplasm. And here we're marking out the letdown. So this wedge of bone is what's going to be removed. And the degree of reduction that we want to do is going to determine how much bone is removed. So here, with the caudal elevator, I'm elevating the subperiosity on the uh, superficial and deep surface of the nasal bone. And with the rondure, we're taking out the bony wedge. And then we introduce the osteotome to perform the osteotomy. <laughs> The osteotomy is then performed. Transverse root osteotomy is done. And that then allows total and complete mobility of the nasal bones to the extent that we want them based on the root, based on the, uh, the wedges that we're taking. So here are a few case examples of that technique. I don't do the ballerina uh, maneuver uh, or similar as, uh, as uh, Carlos has mentioned, separation of the upper lateral cartilage from the bone. And I admit that at times I do have problems with some recurrence of a slight dorsal hump over here uh, and perhaps release of that, uh, that attachment between the upper lat and the nasal bones laterally can be effective, preserving it as you suggest medially to help uh, prevent visible inverted V or irregularity along the brow tip aesthetic line. 
So a few case examples just demonstrating that. So I think we're all one unifying thing that brings the whole world together right now is that we're in the midst of these massive uh, disasters and changes that are taking place. Cottle's endonasal rhinoplasty technique is not a new technique, but remains popular and is becoming even more popular 70 years following its introduction. But it's a tried and true technique with uh, safety and, uh, and effectiveness demonstrated well by many surgeons. As with all techniques, there are challenges, but it's a very worthwhile approach for many patients. And I really enjoy it and recommend it to you guys uh, as time goes on. Thanks very much again, Sam, for uh, hosting this wonderful webinar. Thank you very much, Oren. A really great presentation. And, um, you know, Oren's one of the, I think, few people uh, of my generation, if I can say that, of rhinoplasty surgeons in the US that has been doing this uh, for a while. Uh, so, uh, Oren, when, when, when do you decide to use uh, this method, uh, which I see you're doing basically endonasally? When do you decide to do that, and when do you decide to do an open structure Joseph type reduction? So the uh, the my decision is kind of similar, I think, to what your uh, presentation alluded to. So for me, my decision is mostly based on when I'm going to do tip work. So if major amount of tip work is required. That's when I'm doing it externally because I feel like I have more control over the tip when I do the technique externally. I have a reasonable level of uh, acceptance of maybe slightly less um, finesse at the tip or uh, I, I can accept a slightly wider tip. So I'll do things like uh, trans cartilaginous uh, cephalic trims to reduce the tip. I'll do on uh, less, much less frequent occasion, transdomal sutures through delivery approach. Uh, but I'm okay with not having as tiny a tip as what many of us, uh, many of the other surgeons uh, are comfortable with. So for me, um, if I need a really fine, refined tip, that's when I'm doing an external approach uh, for this. But for reduction of tension on the nose, in order to bring the dorsum down, uh, and for many other tip changes, such as rotation or projection and deep projection, I find this to be outstanding through the endonasal approach. And I turn to external if I need to do manipulation of the tip, uh, if I need to do a vertical dome division and aggressive tip suturing, uh, I'll do that externally. Great. Any, any comments from any of the panelists before we move on? I think Fausto is going to talk about it also, and I'm going to ask after that a couple of questions about it because I think he does something similar. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I love that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lopez Iloa, who's going to talk to us about his experience. Thank you very much, Oren. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sam, for having me here with you today and with the rest of the masters. I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see a lot of uh, same concepts and also same uh, slides. I'm Dr. Lopez Ulloa from Mexico City. And nowadays they have been trying to uh, teach us all the indications of which is the best patient. So we want to have happy patients. So we have to understand what what's uh, what does this patient really want? And we have to understand the nose and how we can achieve that expectation. The aim of your work is not the technique. The nose and the patients are your, your uh, point. This is from uh, my friend Mario Ferraz. Here at the end of the road, it's the expectation and what you can achieve. And there, there are two roads, the difficult one and the simple one. You have to take the one that's best in your hands. I'm gonna show you some cases with a one year post-op at least, the similar technique, some uh, same principles. See, this is lady, osteocartilaginous comp, oral breather, uh, another guy, after one year, two year post-op, see how the uh, inferior the third of the mouth has uh, developed very good. Another three year post op with this technique. You cannot see any stigma of surgery. Seven years of post op, 
is a nice, uh, young, good looking lady without any stigma of nasal surgery. So they asked me to, in one of, of, of these webinars, to say 10 reasons why this technique works. So I'm going to mention the 10, 10 things I know, uh, I think, it, why it really uh, works. Number one, we preserve the anatomic relationship. Number two, we evaluate patients with different pathology and we solve it. And we standardize our surgery. I perform a reproducible surgical routine. This is what we were talking about uh, earlier. The normal anatomy and the shape, it's like an inverted U, not an inverted B. So if you release the ballerina or, or, uh, in the lateral wall, you are preserving this and normal anatomical situation of the cartilage. If you see this from the Rolling Daniels book in the first edition, at the level of the nasal bones, if you do a let down, you open the airway. If you do a half resection, you're closing it and leaving uh, a defect. In the upper lateral cartilage, the same. You open it and preserve this natural form and the valve can collapse if you push your bones in. We see patients with different kinds of pathology, different facial asymmetries, uh, septal problems, breathing problems, and, the, and, and different kind of, of septal pathology and pyramid pathology. So it's not just making a good looking nose, so you have to make it function. You can see this patient, this was not such a big hump, but it was a twisted nose with a very twisted septum. There's no way to make uh, asymmetric hump humpectomy and make those bones uh, in, in the similar length. So we standardized our surgery. First, I do a local infiltration, then the turbinate work, then the endonasal approach, then the septoplasty, oste osteotomies, and then we move the whole thing and rebuilt the nose. This is uh, from a Mexican sculptor named Jorge Marin. We can see the long nose they have. I'm going to show my case because they, uh, they asked me to show one case. Female, 15 years old, history of nasal obstruction, oral breathing, infection diseases. She complains of the crooked nose, a hump, and a bullous tip. If you can see, the whole pyramid is to the right, a big uh, osteocartilaginous hump, that makes like, it seems like the tip is, is pointing down. A bullous tip, you can see in the helicopter view, how the twisted to the right and the bullous tip. I perform uh, CTs to all my patients. This is a pre-op uh, CT where you can see how it has not that bad deviation of the septum, but it has a tension septum with uh, left deviation. And now, a day we have, uh, we can evaluate the soft tissues and the whole uh, skeleton problem. This is my original surgical chart. The let down, uh, getting the pyramid to the middle line, and then you'll see the routine. It's, I always do the general anesthesia. And then we do the local infiltration in, a, in following the order of the incision and doing bilateral incisions. That's part of our approach with lidocaine, epinephrine, and a little more adrenaline. Only three to five milliliters maximum. Then to give it time to work, we address the septums. You have to manage the turbinate hypertrophy. I do an out fraction in all the cases. That would help with the space, so I have enough space to work. And uh, I do a submucosal control radio frequency uh, approach. Then, number four, we do the Fausto Lopez Infante. My dad uh, described this endonasal approach. It's a wide, symmetric, and secure approach. Number five, we have an adequate view with enough working space. And six, we have a progressive and sequential rhinoplasty. This approach, the Fausto Lopez Infante, is just another way to approach the nose. We standardize our own surgery. We dissect and identify the nasal structures before uh, cutting or modify them. And then you can apply any technique you want. This is how we do it. Uh, 
intercartilaginous incision, incision and hemitransfixion incision in a T mode. I, we call it T mode, and then we mark a little bit. This we do it symmetric and undermine the cartilaginous dorsum. It's a wide release of the mucosa and then approach the septum. The advantage of doing it in both sides is that scarring will be symmetric. And you will uh, release, you will release at, uh, at the first time the whole lobular complex. We do the uh, intercartilaginous incision. You can do it transcartilaginous also if you want to modify uh, the lower lateral. And then you join it in a T mode. And then we mark the M plus T. This avoids the circular scar because if you do a Joseph incision, you can have a circular scarring and rounding of the nostrils. You allow rotation and projection because the whole lobular complex is uh, released. It's symmetric and you can reconstruct the cul-de-sac. If you see here, you can see the upper lateral cartilage and the uh, septum. It's a wide exposure. You can see everything. You release all the way to the nasal bones then you complete the transfixion incision so the lobule is released and you can put it wherever you want. You can see this is a pre-op. You can see the nasolabial angle. Here's only with the approach. We haven't modified anything and the angle has uh, improved. So you can dissect, identify and then modify all the structures to reach the adequate form and function. So now you have a complete approach you undermine the dorsum, and then you have to address the septum. We do a scratching of the anterior border of the septum so you can get to the subperichondral plane. Uh, it's very easy with a straight hook. It gives you a, a very nice exposure. Uh, we make uh, four tunnels of cuttle, and we modify how many uh, septum you resect. I'm gonna show you after this. Now here we can see how with a straight hook, you get in the correct plane very easily. This is from Dr. Samuel's article, the way that Saban described the high strip, the way that couple it's a combination of low and high strip. And this is uh, how uh, Dr. Sam and Dr. Neves uh, are doing it right now. I take this from the article, how you see couple Saban and how we do the septal uh, phase in the in the posterior part. We take out almost everything and then we reposition. That's very important. Reposition in a straight uh, line the um, the fragments. This is our first cut in the quadrangular uh, cartilage. I do it with a beaver or with a crescent blade. I'm gonna uh, go faster. Then the second cut, we do it with a Ballinger or, or a, with a Ballinger knife. It's a seed swivel all the way back to the junction of the bone and the cartilage. In that part, it, it's a little wider, so it won't, uh, the Ballinger won't, won't go through. Then the third cut, I do in the junction of the cartilage and the bone, and then take out with a strong scissor the perpendicular plate. This uh, allows you to address any type of septal deviation. If you have a big spur, you can take it out and uh, make it straight and reposition it at the end of the surgery. So now you have a good defect. Uh, you have a cartilage for your grafting and for reposition, how I told you. Then you release the ventral aspect of the cartilage in the premaxilla. So with that, you can adjust the height of the septum, see? So if we change the plane of cross section to the lower part, you can see a tension septum. You take out whatever you need of the ventral part and it would give you the correct height, okay? This is uh, how it looks when you're moving it. You have done your osteotomies, you mobilize and push down so the septum won't fit, it bends, okay? So if you push it up, you can see how it makes like a spring action. So you have to take out uh, whatever you need. You can see here and after you adjust the height, 
the septum is straight. After doing that, you, uh, I suture it to the anterior nasal spine with a figure eight stitch and make it double. Then we do the osteotomies. When the septum is complete and released, we do the osteotomies. The leg down is taking a wedge of the lateral bone. I do it through a vestibular incision, just like uh, Dr. Oren showed. I do the superstial tunnels in the inside and the outside. That was described by Hootsing in 1975, I think so. Cauterize, and you can use a two millimeter chisel or a leopard gubia. You can see it's very important to, to cut only the mucosa. Don't go through the, the muscle, don't go all the way through the bone because if not, it will, it will start bleeding. You can see just the mucosa and then spread and dissect the muscle, not, not cutting it, okay? And then I cauterize. I have no bleeders, but I, ca I like to cauterize. So that was that going to give us a minimum mor morbidity. After that, we do the superstial tunnels. This is the bone. We do a tunnel on the outside all the way to the medial canthus. You can see here the periosteum in the inside and in the outside. Then we do, you can do it with a chisel, the upper uh, osteotomy first, and then the lower one. It's the upper and the lower one. And then we complete it with a transverse incision. This is the way you can do it with a, the lateral with the chisel. These are two millimeter guarded uh, chisels that they're very uh, useful. They won't move, they won't go out of the bone. And then the lateral or the double, you can do it with a lampard gubia. In a, in a one-way uh, manner. You're gonna take out this wedge of, of bone. You can hear how it breaks, and then you take it out. Okay. Then you complete you complete the transverse incision. It's, it's, sorry. It's important to complete the transverse uh, osteotomy in an oblique way, so it will make a step that uh, Dr. Goxel mentioned it. And it's really important also to uh, make it like a postal stamp. First I mark the point where I want the fracture to go through, I mark it like this postal stamp so I can have a, the hinge movement. Uh, in some parts, it's going to be like a green stick fracture. And in other ones, it's going to uh, have some periosteum that it will prevent this to go all the way down or in and have a, a very bad step. If you can see at the end of this osteotomy, it would release the whole bony pyramid and the septum. It's just, when it's marked, there it goes. It breaks. And now you can move it wherever you want, okay? So after you take out the wedges, you make your transverse, so you can move the pyramid to the right, to the left. You can make, leave it straight, or you can make, twist it a little more. This is a video we made with uh, Dr. Sam's most course. You have the wedge you take out and the movement of the bones. And this, you have to stay at the same height. We call uh, Dr. Call it SPAR, Septopyramidal Adjustment and Reposition. So you can see the nose, it's straight. Here's another video, this is a live patient. You have 
you just grab the septum and you can leave it higher or you can leave it lower. And this is how it works, the, the movement, when you take out the whole septum, the quadrangular cartilage is going to go uh, further and uh, rotate so the tip would be in a better position. This is the video that Dr. Samos showed. He, uh, it's a courtesy, he made it in Rinsambul. This is the way the septum goes all the way to the front and up. And after, after you fix the whole pyramid, the septum to the anterior nasal spine, you can replace some fragments of uh, bone or cartilage. And I, that's very important so you don't have functional problems afterward. And I usually uh, suture them with these transeptal stitches. So to finish with this, the SPAR, the septopyramid uh, adjustment and reposition modifies and adjusts to a normal anatomy. You have minimal morbidity because you have an adequate plane of dissection and you are, have to be very careful with all the tissues and cauterize and all the, those things. And you have to uh, have long-term follow-ups, detailed surgical chart, charts and teach. These are some patients in the Instagram. And we are going back to the, the case. This lady with a twisted nose and 18 months post-op result. You have the big hump. You have a straight nose with no uh, stigmas of surgery in the three quarter views. See how she had uh, improved her middle in the lower third because she's breathing through her nose. You can see the change. She was a 15 year old lady, remember that? You have uh, the twisted nose and now the straight uh, dorsum. The infant lobule, the bullous tip, and with just uh, some uh, crushed cartilage, a little uh, intercural strut, you can have that. And now I can, I can show, uh, this is a post-op CT, this is the pre-op CT, and this is the post-op CT. You can see the straight and complete septum. If you reposition, you will have an, uh, a complete septum. You are not going to have any problems. And you can see the bones, after doing this wet resection, it's very precise. You can see after 18 months how it, it developed. Here's a little, little space because that's the way you turn to the left, the, the, the whole pyramid. So we take a bigger wedge in this side. This is a, a reconstruction that 3D uh, CT scan, you can see here the transverse incision. It's also very precise. When you mark it, it's very precise. And at the end, you have to be a student and keep learning and you have to improve. This was in Spanish, but I, I tried to translate. If you learn to be all terrain or uh, you will find extra roads. So you have to combine and do whatever is best in your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fausto. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And, and um, I think you are the very first person that ever introduced me to this technique about 18 years ago when I saw you speak in Portland or some, something like that over 15, 16 years ago. Um, we have a, just a couple of questions I want to take because we want to get, get on with the, the lectures. And they're for both of you guys, really. Um, so one person asked, and this is a question everybody can answer really is, if too much bone is removed laterally, and this is from, uh, from uh, a fellowship director out there actually. So if too much bone is removed laterally, how do you correct that? Well, I think the first answer is don't remove too much. I can tell you for, I mean, it's just like any, if you do a Joseph resection, don't resect too much, be careful. Uh, and secondly, I think this, the septum will really help you set the height. Um, you, you wanna get good bone-bone contact for healing laterally, but you will, you will get some of that superiorly even if the, the portion of the letdown doesn't make contact. But, so I don't think it's, it's a big problem as long as you're conservative and you don't remove a ridiculous amount of bone. What have you, have you ever seen this, Oren or Fausto? And any comments about that question? Yes. I think um, it really doesn't matter. Sometimes when you, uh, your 
wedge, uh, when you're setting that bone wedge with the ranger, sometimes it goes out a little more than the of bone that you want. But that's not a problem. If, if you, how you said, if you, the septum is giving the height, that would heal very well. Yeah. You, you won't have a, a, they have many worries because of, of collapse and in, instability. If you do the, an open approach and, and use the PSO and uh, undermine everything, so that's, uh, I understand why you have some instability and, and those concerns. But with this approach, with the close approach, it's, you have a very controlled way of dealing with that. I, I never put back any more bone if it goes out more. So just uh, leave it to the septum. I think Carlos had a, want to make a comment real quick. Carlos, did you want to make a comment? Yes. I want. Um, in fact, the lateral wall, I rather prefer to remove a little bit more than less of the bone. I'll show you in my talk that I, I, I always do let down. Because what controls is the stability of the septum. It's not what touches in the lateral wall because or it sinks or you create a, a gap in between. And uh, I had opportunity to, to do revisions in cases of mine uh, where I did let down. And after I, I did again a full open, I can see that that gap, it, it, it fills with bone. Because if you respect, if you respect the, the periosteum in both, in, in both sides, you, you just, it creates a deposit of, of bone over there. It's a whitish bone, a thinner bone, but in fact, it is replaced with bone. So no problem if you, leave a gap of bone in the end of the surgery in lateral wall, it doesn't matter at all. Do you, this is another question that's out there. I think it's a good one because we never really thought to address this. For me personally, I don't, I don't uh, do any different, anything different with internal external splinting in these patients postoperatively. Is that the same for the rest of you? If you're doing one technique versus another? It's the same for me. Yeah. I do, I do the regular steps. Yeah. Me too. And Okay, we'll, we'll probably answer some more of these questions at the end. I'm going to um, then turn the, the, the screen over to uh, Carlos, Dr. Neves uh, from Portugal, who's going to share with us uh, his experience uh, and his uh, methods. So, Carlos, you want to take over? Yes, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. So Sam, thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is in fact a group of friends and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to talk about the preservation of rhinoplasty. It's something that I've been doing for years and uh, before I, I start my own thoughts, I wanted to thank this man, Wilson Daves, and Fausto just talked about the SPAR. Um, Wilson Daves was my teacher in 2007, eight. And uh, it's because of him that I'm talking here about that, because till that time I, I learned, you know, the, the classical uh, resective uh, rhinoplasty. But Wilson Davis taught me how to do it in different ways. And in fact, he, he could do everything he liked in, in the nose. So this is the SPAR A, and it's A because in Portuguese, A alto means high. So this is the way he, he, he used to do the, the high strip uh, rhinoplasty or preservation rhinoplasty and this is the SPAR B, B for Portuguese stands for baixo which is low, low uh, strip uh, and he introduced uh, some modifications like this one you see that he, he, he kept this uh, basal strip, this premaxilla strip till the anterior nasal spine, not a caudal strip, a basal strip where he could suture the rest of the pyramid to stabilize it. And uh, so because of him, I started doing uh, dorsal preservation rhinoplasty, but at a certain point, I was not so happy with some outcomes. And we know that um, this kind of approach can have some stigma. And the stigma are basically this residual hump. It's nice. And we can say that, okay, a residual hump is nice. You know, it's not that bad. But in my philosophy, it's nice if I want to, to give it. It's not nice if I couldn't. Uh, avoid it. Um, and then you can have the super tip settling main, mainly in low strips. Sometimes you have the radix steps. And so this is one case of mine. I did it 2010, if I'm not wrong. And you see, this is the typical uh, situation that I found in some results of mine with this residual hump. 
because I couldn't get rid of this um, spring effect and that I could not stabilize the rhenium part. And sometimes uh, it could create a super cheap settling. And it happens because, and it was already mentioned and Goxel talked about that, if you bring it down, you bring it with the same curve and you cannot sometimes control it to a, a flat uh, uh, profile. So what you need to do, in fact, is to have two uh, distal point stabilization, green in, uh, sorry, the, the radix part, the super T part, and in the middle of it, you need something to push it uh, down. You need something to stabilize it below the rhenium. So that's why all my work for the last years was stressing, 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 stress, stressing to stabilize it below the rhenium. So regarding the lateral wall, and I'm starting from the lateral wall, as I just said, I always do the let down. I, re I remove this um, wedge of bone. As I said, it doesn't matter if you leave a gap in the end of the surgery. I rather to prefer to leave a gap than to create some con contacting points, mainly uh, next to the um, medial uh, uh, tendon, because sometimes you know it, you create like uh, a blocking points. And so this right side, I did uh, um, a letdown, so I removed the wedge. And you see the left side, I did a push down, and you see that the bow, the bone goes in. And I really like to avoid that. Um, uh, I'll show in my case, I do it. In with piezo, but in fact, you can do it very precisely with an osteotome. If you use the border of it, it's like the, I just said, this, this is a manual, manual piezo, and you can, you can uh, avoid tearing the, the peri uh, osteum. You see that the vessels, everything is, uh, is, is safe. And as I said, if you preserve both sides, you, you'll have the positive bone in the post-op uh, um, uh, post um, healing process. Uh, as Goxel commented already, he calls it the, lateral, the ballerina maneuver. I call it the split maneuver. We've, and we've been doing it because if you want to get rid with that this convexity arch, you need to put it flat. You need to augment the, the, the distance of the basal part because the upper part, because it's convex, is bigger than the lower part. So you need to augment the lower part. So you need to release. It's not just the ligament. It's the mucosa and it's the, the lower parts of the upper laterals. Otherwise, it doesn't go up. That's why you have parts of the spring effect. Okay, so how much, how far do I go? Like this. If you keep like three, four, five millimeters, and you can just dissect a little bit in the end of the surgery when you try to flatten the, the dorsum, you go, and if you need, you just go into, you release a little bit. And uh, are we talking about inverted V? If you keep the dorsal, uh, line intact, you cannot end up with an inverted V. So if you say like three, four, five millimeters or sometimes less, it depends on the hump, you, you're not in danger. Okay, and if you take advantage of the previous dissection, if you do the, this letdown, you just go up, 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 and you go and you release till the level you desire. Okay, and then you can have this, you see the line, it's impossible to have an inverted V because the line is kept there, but you free it all, all and then you can start with this convexity and end up with this flattened profile. Okay, regarding the, the, the medial wall, as I said, I learned low, I learned high approach, but I changed uh, um, because I was not happy because I could not control the final, final results and because I had some residual humps, I started to do the, this intermediate, what I call the intermediate approach. And the goal is to keep some cartilage below the rhenium because in the end of the procedure, I want to resuture it. And um, you need to do another split in the mid wall because you want to get rid of, of the convexity. And when you press it down, you see that all the parts just touch. And after that, this is the most important thing in my point of view. And as, um, as uh, Oren was, was telling, uh, I felt an alien for many years because uh, I was one of the few, like Fausto or Isava or Dave talking about that. But I used to stress that even if for the majority of people it did, didn't make sense because they were not using with this concept. But I used to stress that you need to stabilize below the rhenium. Otherwise, you don't have the perfect control of the final results. Some, of them, of the results, you'll have P 
beautiful profiles, but some of them you'll have the residual hump and I don't like uh, uh, the result without having control over it. So then there was this evolution. And uh, in fact, the Tetris concept, which is some similarities with the same uh, concept, uh, is, is exactly the same thing about the previous one, but keeping safe uh, a caudal strut, a caudal bar. Uh, if you see this, the, the, the gray line is exactly at the same level of, of the previous uh, demonstration. So it's, I would say, a partial intermediate. It's not a subdorsal or high or lower. This is a, a intermediate or partial intermediate approach. So what I do, I design a block right below the cartilaginous uh, vaults starting in the waza, where the, the caudal border of the upper lateral cartilages that goes till the highest point of our hump. And then I just remove the amount, the amount of cartilage that I want to bring down the dorsum. So you remove this piece and if you want to go there again, you just remove another piece and you put the level of the dorsum where you want. And this is the great, great advantage of the technique because you can stabilize it below the rhenium, so, and so you don't have the pop, pop up effect again. And more than that, we add another new thing. You stabilize it in another axis. So you have two axis stabilization. And we we're talking about lateral wall. The lateral wall doesn't stabilize nothing, but because you do this uh, vertical suturing, you control, you are controlling also the axial, axial axis. So you control the coronal and the axial axis. So another, a positive aspect of this technique. So this is a cadaveric dissection, just to show you. You can do this block with seven, eight, ten. You decide five millimeters. You need this, uh, enough space just to pass the sutures. Then you mark the highest point of your hump, and then you just go and and and, and you cut it and you free the block. Then you design how much you want to. Sorry, the video stopped how much you want to uh, reduce. Uh, again, you can remove it and then you can go again and remove a little bit more. And this is a tip that I give you, go just below the vault. Don't remove a, a lot of, of septum in this area in one movement because you can end up with uh, a, a, a step. So remove just small fragments. Sometimes you don't need to, to remove bone. And when you do that, you create the space and then you create this posterior and forward uh, uh, caudal uh, uh, movement. And this is what flattens uh, your dorsum. Um, it can resemble the, the, a mini cutsel, as sometimes Yves Sabin or Goxel uh, used, 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 used to call it. But let me tell you that it's a little bit more than that, or it's much more than that. So when you do this, this caudal movement, of course you have this overlap of the cartilage, and then you need to remove this piece because you want it to fit uh, uh, really well in, in, in the pocket that you created. And now we stabilize it. And look at that, when you stabilize it, and it could be like the mini caudal, what happens in the end of your stabilization is that you still have the residual hum. Look, you have it up. So and when you press it down, you see that you have this spring effect. And so with this stabilization below the rhenium is where you really get the flatten in the final uh, uh, results uh, with accuracy and preservability. Okay, so here are the stitches below the rhenium and then the vertical stabilization always also make in my hands a big difference. So three stabilized points and the super tip and uh, Sam showed in his technique that he, uh, he does the same thing. You can use it as, as a strut and as extension of the septum, but it avoids also to have a super tip deformity. Here you see the block sutured and now you just cut, you know, you tailor it the way you want it to, to end up. So that's why I like to call it the segments of preservation because what matters in the end is to control every segment. You, you, you control the red segment, below the rhenium, the cartilaginous segment, the super tip segment. And to introduce my case, 
let me show you uh, this interesting aspect. Cases like that, where you have a deviation of the old pyramid, is to say, okay, you need to go for a low strip to do a cuddle because you want to mobilize all the pyramid. But look at the result. I used the, the kind of Tetris overlap, a lateral Tetris maneuver, that in fact, uh, you don't remove this, a strip below the block. Instead, you just overlap the block and you, you take advantage of this few millimeters uh, lateralization of the block. And of course, uh, uh, and it, it was been already talked about, we can uh, um, harvest cartilage if you just keep the L shape and because everything is sutured, you have sometimes, like in that case, a double cartilage placed side by side. So your uh, L is even, is even stronger than a normal L. And this is the effect uh, after the, the case. And this is, just the previous case that I showed you, that it's straight. So let me show you my case, uh, a lateral Tetris. And this surgery, I record it for uh, uh, Yves Saban uh, meeting in Nice. Something wrong with the computer. Okay. Uh, sorry, Sam. It's just stopped. This is the video. Sam, just a second. Sure. Are, are you are you seeing my desktop? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So the case, I was saying that I filmed this case for uh, Yves Saba meeting in Nice last uh, February. And uh, I, I wanted to show you, uh, because you can, of course, use in straight noses, simple noses, but noses like that, difficult nose, even here you can adapt the, 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 the concept. Uh, as already said, uh, if you pick the right patient for the right technique, the better. But honestly, I'm trying to push a little bit the technique and it can work in even in more difficult cases. So as you see, we have uh, completely different side walls of the nose, deviated nose, a high uh, dorsum. And so let's take a look at, at, at the surgery. So I'm going to, to skip it. So I used to do a supraperichondral, like, like uh, Goxel showed, I also like to go over the perichondrum. I, uh, I dissect the ligaments and then I reposition it. I do a full open because uh, I like to see my osteotomies. I always see my osteotomy, no matter if I use piezo like here or if I use osteotome. So I'm doing the transverse osteotomy. Now I'm doing the two lateral osteotomies because I want to remove the wedge, as I just showed you. The other side, the same concept. You remove the piece of bone. You detach it from both um, walls. Um, um, very osteum, and here I'm doing the, the um, lateral sp split, so by ballerina maneuver. Okay, let's go to the middle wall. So now you mark the block, you start at the waza, then you mark the height of the block, depends on you, then you mark the highest point of your, of your hump, and then you mark the cephalic parts of the block. Okay, you free the block, and now you'll see that you have the, the cartilaginous part free. So you can settle the nose or bring it up, just the cartilaginous part. Now I'm going to remove pieces of the upper part below the bone of the septum. And you see the movement that you can achieve. And it uh, stops from getting a step. And okay, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to overlap what you are, are looking here in this the very dissection because I want to take advantage of this deviation I'm going to put it side by side and I'm going to suture it like that so just by doing this and because the deviation was to the right side of the patient I'm bringing it to the left side look at the flatness the flat uh, flatten um, dorsum now after we did all these maneuvers to get rid of the spring effect and here I am suturing side by side of the caudal uh, strut, natural caudal strut. Now I'm suturing it below the rhenium 
And so I'm safe now because I'm quite sure that the spring effects will not happen. So the way I leave my dorsum is the way I will have it in the end of the day. Now I'm going to carve the excess of the, of the strut that I, I, I left intact and I'm really designing my profile. And in the end of all the structural procedure, if I like, I go with my burr and I refine the dorsum. So you can control even half a millimeter, I would say, of your profile. Okay, so now one of the questions is, can you harvest septum after you do that? Of course, because I have my l strut very, very, you know, uh, stabilized. And even now you can mobilize the, the L shape. You can put your sutures in anterior nasal spine. You can do whatever you like because the L shape is stabilized. You can put more sutures, as I said, to access stabilization. And because lateral walls are free, even if you do um, let down or, or push down, so you depend on this stabilization. And now I'm going to do my tip. Just a curiosity, because I like to do the ANSA banner, which is an extens uh, extensor. And because I, I put it all always side to side, I'm taking another advantage of this lateralization because I'm putting it uh, aside from the, the, the deviated parts. And so I, I get it in, 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 in the midpoint of, 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 of the face. And so this is immediate results of lateral view. And this is the, the, the base view when I finished the surgery. Remember how deviated that case was. And so here you can see it. This is three to four months post-op because I filmed it in the end of January, as I told you, that you can see still some edema in the tip. Uh, okay, three quarters view. Look how you could get a nice profile. The, the burr here, burr or piezo, whatever you like. The, the, the basal view, you see the symmetry of the base. The upper view, it, I put this image like that because it's interesting because when pa patients have a symmetry of the face, all the posture is asymmetric. The body posture is asymmetric. And look at that. She always does the same posture when she takes pictures. And you ask her, put your head straight. And it says, but it's straight. It's very interesting. And here is a video showing you how it is now. Uh, this is an iPhone video. Sorry for the quality of the image. But just to show you that the pyramid now is straight and the tip is in the midline. As just to show another case with a one year case, similar one, because this one is just a three months post op, three, four months, but it's the same concept. Look at lateralization of the whole structure. You put it in the midline, you do your T plus, your structure, the T plus, three quarters view and profile view. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sam, sorry for my technical problems. <laughs> No problem. Thank you very much. That's that's really an excellent presentation. And we have a few questions, but I think I want to hold those to the end because we're just we're, we're we're running long on time. I want to make sure I give uh, Miguel enough time to give his talk. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and there's some definitely some similarities to the things that we're doing. And and you're just uh, I love all the dissections that you did. Very very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Um, okay. Uh, Miguel, are you ready to roll? And then we'll do some questions at the yeah. end. Um, with some I think so. Okay. Let's try. Okay. Well, good afternoon, good morning in California, in Mexico. Thanks, Sam, for the, the invitation. I'm going to talk about the sparrow technique in preservation rhinoplasty. And uh, why we the hemp, we must achieve three clear objectives. We must lower the dorsum, we must flatten the dorsum, and this is the most difficult part to achieve, and we must smooth the dorsum, and that is not that difficult to achieve. So this is the, uh, somehow the famous diagram from Dr. Daniel and Dr. Cousins, dorsal preservation, uh, tip preservation, and soft tissue preservation. And uh, uh, we are talking about uh, dorsal preservation, and I think that we should split this group uh, in two different, sorry, in two different uh, subgroups what we could call the foundation techniques and the surface techniques. And this is for me, structurally, this is very, very different um, the way we approach the, the preservation techniques. So uh, in the foundation techniques, you can see that th there is an intact dorsum with the east osteocartilaginous vault impactation. All the nose goes down. This is a classical push down, let down that we have heard the last four uh, speakers talking about. 
and there are different ways, high strip, medium strip, low strip, but uh, in the end, we have to do a transverse oste osteotomy and lateral osteotomies, and all the pyramid goes down. So this is what I could call impact, impactation osteotomies. The surface techniques, we do dorsal modification or cartilaginous bolt modulation, and it's very important to do bony cap removal or reshaping, and this allows us to work just in this area of the nose. We don't have to work with all the nodes. And this solved uh, some of the problems of the classical preservation uh, uh, techniques. So no impactation osteotomies in the surface techniques. My technique is a surface technique, as I will show you. For us, the most important anatomical landmark is this E point, or ethmoidal point, the junction between the perpendicular plate and the, the nasal bones. We made a detailed study radiological study that we published in ASJ. And what we found interesting, when you go cephalocaudally in this direction, first we have the ethmoidal point in 97% of our patients, and then we have the beginning of the nasal hem. So there is a space here that uh, we should uh, uh, know better. So where is the problem in our patients of the hem? In the caudal aspect of the nasal bones, upper lateral cartilages and the cartilaginous septum, that's why we developed the spare root technique exactly here. We published the first outcomes in laryngoscope. It was the cover last uh, December. We published the technique itself in PRS and we have other uh, publications. So this is a simple case. Well, broken aesthetic lines, uh, slightly uh, crooked nose or inverted C. This is not a contraindication for preservation as Carlos just showed. This is an indication in my opinion for the spare root technique and an oily skin and an initial ham. So the spare roof technique itself, of course, this is the step zero. We do always a classical l stroke septoplasty, whatever is the, the deviation. We just have to spare the superior and interior, as you can see here. So we do always an l shape septoplasty. And then this is the first step. We go all along till the ethmoidal point. It means till after the beginning of the initial ham. And we just release the upper laterals from the septum, as you can see. So we create a gap at this point without touching the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Then we cut a strip of septum just below the hem, and we spare the anterior dorsal septum, as you can see. Of course, then we have to take out that cartilaginous septum, the dorsal septum. Here we did about three millimeters just for teaching purposes normally one millimeter. And at this stage, we still have the hemp exactly the same, but we have a gap here between the upper laterals or the middle ball and the remaining septum that is completely attached to the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and less the L-shaped uh, septoplasty that we have made. This is the third step, one of the most critical, uh, and we are doing the dissection of the dorsal and the lateral keystone area, as I told you uh, a minutes ago. We can do this with the piezo. I do with the diamond bird, number four. It's for me much, much, much more faster. And this is not an open roof. This is a closed roof. You can see completely closed. The middle vault, the upper laterals are completely spared. This is the old keystone area. This is the area that we did the ostectomy. We just released. And we have in the end one a noticeable step that you, you even can feel it. This is the old keystone area, the new keystone, uh, keystone area, and you will see how smooth it is the new keystone area in the video. You just have to drill with caution, of course, uh, to burr or with a, a piezo device or even with a rasp if it, it's not that big. This is very important. For instance, in this lady that I operate on, this is a kyphotic nose, as shaped in nasal bones. And this is one of the most important problems, in my opinion, of the classical preservation um, uh, rhinoplasty. Uh, this is what Lazovich has published, that, and he told that uh, about 88% of the cadavers that he study had a kephotic nose. So this is the kifian, the most higher part of the, of the bony hand, and it's impossible to flatten the nose. Of course, we can rasp, but th that's what, one more reason for us to do the ostectomy. Rasping is doing ostectomy. We are taking out bone. So to deal with this hemp, we have to do ostectomy of the dorsal keystone area. About releasing the lateral keystone area that we have talked a few minutes ago and the stability of the piriform aperture, there are many surgeons that they are concerned about that. Is it safe? 
with this technique, which is the only that I can talk about, yes, we have made so far more than 500 patients. And if we, we go back to the history, we see that, we see that in 1999, George Ishida, the father, uh, has a clear description of the lateral keystone area. He didn't call that because at that time, that space was, that doesn't have that name. In uh, the 2013, Jankowski did exactly the same with the dorsal keystone area and the lateral keystone area. 2016, me, myself, the first article on, on uh, the spare roof technique, I did the description with the, the dissection of the lateral keystone area. And uh, later on, Goxel, uh, as you showed a few minutes ago, the dissection of the lateral keystone area. So it's a uh, safe step. This is for teaching purposes. You can do this in my technique. You can do this because it's supported in the middle by the septum and the shape. There's no way to do a, a, an inverted V. The problem of the inverted V is when you open the middle bowl and uh, the, 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 the lower light, the upper light rows, they go down and you have an inverted V. So there's the shape, this, this U shape, natural shape is absolutely preserved when you release the lateral keystone area. You can clearly see here what we do with the spare roof technique. We do the ostectomy of the dorsal and a little bit of the lateral keystone area. We release the lateral keystone area as far as needed. And then we allow this movement. So the middle bolt just goes down till the till to be supported by the dorsal aspect of the septum. So this is a precision technique. There's no chance of lateralization because this is, you saw, in the end, we still have one millimeter, two millimeters of nasal bones that are superimposed with the, 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 the upper part, the cranial part of the upper laterals, and no chance of settling because it's supported by the quadrangular septum here below. So this is the fourth step after releasing the lateral keystone area. We have to suture the upper laterals to the, to the septum. I do it most of the times indonesially, but this is for teaching purposes. I did the notch outside. I use the four OPDS for this uh, step and this is, you can control exactly the way you do, like when you are performing the component dorsal reduction. It's a very easy to do open. Close is not that easy, but there is another way to do it close that I can teach you. And you can compare here, before releasing the lateral keystone area, we still have a, a gap and the surface anatomy is exactly the same. But here we have lower all the dorsum and this is not an open, this is a closed roof. We don't have to, uh, to solve any open roof, completely closed roof, cartilaginous roof. The osteotomies that I do lateral only, it, it's not necessary. I always do uh, osteotomies not to close an open roof, but just to thinner this part of the, of the, the, the nose. We don't have to do this to complete the, the technique itself. I always finish with the PRF plus cartilage powder or dust or shave. There is a confusion about the a semantic discussion about what is, this is not dicey, this is powder or dust or shape with PRF. I always do it. And you can see in the end what we have, a much more relaxed base view with the piriform shape. No hemp anymore. You can see the hemp is gone, of course. And this is the profile view of a male patient that uh, uh, the picture, the patient is from abroad. He sent me the pictures. They are not good quality, the post-op pictures. Anyway, you can see the three quarters view and you can see the profile view. And here, one more case, very interesting, that is somehow paradigmatic about this, this, uh, this technique. You can see broken aesthetic lines with a crooked S-shaped nose. And you can clearly see a droppy tip and of course a nasal hem. So when we open the nose, we see that the surface anatomy, as always, has to do with the structural anatomy. And we have this shape of the nasal, of the, the upper lateral cartilage of the middle bolt. That's why we have to deal with it and we have to reshape the middle bolt. Well, we did the, the, the spare roof technique. We release again the lateral keystone area. And in the end, you can see clearly the difference and the control that we have in the dorsum a completely closed door from this is not a, a, an open roof. And you can see the differences that we have in the, in the, the, the aesthetic lines completely parallel. And you can see the outcomes. This is one year after the surgery with a crooked nose deviation. Base view, three quarters, sorry for the pictures and the profile view. 
Very interesting when we compare the spare roof technique with the component torso reduction, and this is very interesting in my opinion. You can see here, this is an open roof, of course, component torso reduction, we open the roof. Here in the spare roof technique, we don't open the roof, we have just this gap below the upper laterals or the middle vault. Then here, the excess of cartilage just sinks medially, descends medially, and is secured in the component torso reduction with the outer spreader flaps or spreader flaps. And here, the excess of cartilage sinks laterally in the lateral keystone area, just goes down. And the roof is exactly the same, like nature made it, in a way we can control it. Just two more examples to be clear. Well, typical broken aesthetic lines, nasal hemp, tension or short nose. You can see one year outcome, you can see the aesthetic line is completely different. You can control the dorsum. There's no problems with the S-shaped nasal bones and you don't feel any weft or flap, of course. This is preservation rhinoplasty. And another example, another case with a slightly crooked nose, as you can see, broken aesthetic lines again, nasal hemp, tension nose, and you can see one year post-op, the dorsum is completely smooth. We don't have any rafts, any flaps. We just move up a little bit the keystone area. And you can see the three quarters view as well and the profile view. So in the end, what we have aesthetic and functional outcomes tested and published, stability of the key area and piriform aperture tested and published, efficient in crooked noses is very important, efficient in S shaped with nasal bones, allows traditional septal maneuvers, and this is very important short learning curve, safe and predictable, and preservation is not necessarily classic push down or let down. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miguel. And, and um, I'm very happy to uh, have you provide a counterpoint to uh, some of the other talks that we've heard and talk about another way of preservation. I think uh, that's very interesting. And, and I also applaud you for your outcomes work uh, that you use in your patients. and. Um, uh, I have a couple, we're, we've run over, so I just want to do a couple of questions that we've received and, uh, and go from there. One question that came up, uh, Miguel, for you is, uh, do you always resect the septum below before you do the dorsal resection? In other words, for yes. your l -strut. okay. So, yes, uh, I always do, the, always do the septoplasty. Well, I, I could say that about 90% of the patients, they have a septal deviation. And you know, my, my background is ENT and it, it's my, my ADN, I just, my, my DNA, sorry. I, I have to do the septoplasty uh, unless, or at least to collect septum to do something in the end. But uh, uh, yes, I do always the septoplasty first and then I reset the... Okay, you never get into a problem where you, the L-strut gets a little bit too narrow. I mean, just the order you do it, that's all. Well, you, you have to pay attention. Of course, there, there was a, a learning curve. Yeah. When I did in the, the beginning with the rasp, you have to take attention because sometimes the, the, the part that connects with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid is not that, that uh, stuff. Sometimes it's fragile and you can broken it. I don't know if this is what you were talking about, but yeah. Yeah. you have to be um, very sensitive okay, to avoid that. Question for Carlos and Goxel. A couple of people asked uh, what instrument you use to cut the bone. I think uh, Goxel, you showed a piezo. If you don't have that available, what do you use to cut the bone? Uh, and also, Carlos, what do you do? Up high, up high in the ethmoid region. Oh. Uh, I prefer to use piezo uh, if I have the long insert of piezo because sometimes I cannot reach them because companies are not producing nowadays. So if I don't have piezo, I use baby ronger. So very fine, uh, nice, sharp baby ronger can be helpful. But there is a trick. If you use baby ronger, grab the bone and turn it, you can uh, create some unwanted fracture lines on the perpendicular plate. So the tricky thing that you have to use like fingernail cutter, then you have to make click, 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 then you have to be in safe. Carlos? Um, as I said, in many cases, you just cut cartilage. You don't need to cut bone. Yeah. Um, and so the medicine bone scissors, it's, it's great because it's curved. So first I do it with the curve, the convex part up there, because I want to, you know, just to uh, 
follow the, the, the vault, and then I go around and I cut. Imagine that, let me see my finger. Okay, so this is my osteotomy, my lateral osteotomy. So I cut first like that, and then I go like that to avoid, you not know, to create a step below the transverse osteotomy. If it's bone, I always try with a medicine bone scissors, which in fact, the majority of times I can. If not, I go with uh, a stronger scissors. I have the baby runger, but I don't know. In my hand, sometimes I bite bigger pieces and sometimes I don't control the steps. So let me tell you that last six months, I never used it, just scissors and I like to go directly. I think the, the message direction. that you're sending is, first of all, a lot of the, the, the area underneath there is actually cartilaginous and people need to realize that there's a cartilaginous extension underneath uh, the key area. Exactly. Exactly. Secondly, yeah. secondly, as, as Goxalan, and you have said to be very careful with that cut, don't over resect, if anything, underdo it, mm. so you don't create a step, so you have some stability to if, prevent overdropping. If you resect it below the rhenium, you know, the, when, I mean, the caudal part of the ethmoidal plate or the, this uh, cartilaginous septum ethmoidal plate union, if you do it below the rhenium, there's no problem. The thing is when you reach below your transverse osteotomy is, is where you really can have problems because it just settles down. So right. try to avoid big cuts in that region. Right. Fausto, Oren, do you have any comments on that? Uh, no, that's, uh, I think that same applies. I mean, oftentimes with the low strip caudal as we're calling it, or the caudal as we know it, uh, most of that high, all of that high bone can be kept in place. Um, and one other point that I wanted to make is in terms of prevention of that collapse. And I think if we're talking about preservation, it's worth mentioning this. The reason to do endonasal, all the discussion about ligaments and all the discussion about preservation, if you're doing endonasal, you're preserving most of these things. Or frequently, like Miguel mentions uh, in his spare roof technique where he's filing things down, and I learned this from Fausto, when I was struggling with uh, residual humps, I said, Fausto, I'm still having a problem with this. So he said, oh, because sometimes you need to file it down in order to get rid of that hump. So Miguel, what he's describing of uh, contouring the bone is definitely something that is a common thing in the caudal as well, where you make a very small uh, incision under the skin, subperiosteal tunnel on the bone, file the bone down a touch with a handheld rasp in a very, very tight pocket so you're preserving all of the skin attachments. So the likelihood of a collapse of a saddle is very small because the skin is also helping to tent everything up. So it's just another part of preserving all of these in, uh, structures that are supportive. Yeah, it's, it, it's important to realize that each nose is different and each septoplasty is different. Like Miguel uh, told us, we are ENTs and, and we have to deal with, with that uh, septoplasty problems. Uh, another issue that they are very afraid of, like in Savant's technique of taking out the perpendicular plate under the bones, is because you're going up. You're, it, it, you're going all the way to the cranial base. That's why they're very afraid of, of CSF leaks and, and all those things. If you go up, all the way up, because you're going to get into the cranium. In, in the septoplasty uh, I do, and we almost do, you're going right to the back, to the coana. So you're not having problems with the cranium. So each septum is different. If you have a, a, a little twisted perpendicular plate, you can just grab it and, and, and move it to the middle line and, and leave it there. You don't have to take it out. It makes sense? Yeah. So, and, and then you have a straight septum and that would uh, prevent all for falling down. Other thing that prevents for falling down, if you use the, the saw, a big saw, and make a, a great cut, that can go down and make a, a, a big step. What we do and what uh, Goxel was talking about doing the oblique uh, osteotomy is to prevent the, this from falling down so it would heal uh, and make, don't make that step. Have you seen my video? The movement is like this. The hump 
So don't do the hump and move it like this. And Fausto, you do postage stamps all the way around, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that also helps. Stamp. So when you, it's like when you want to crack a big uh, ice cube, okay? They mark it and then they hit it very hard, and all the, the fracture goes through the marks. If you want to cut a, a big uh, window or crystal, you mark it and then they give it a, a small uh, hit and it goes all the way where, where it's marked. So that's very controlled. Uh, just, I'm gonna finish up with one last question for each person and then uh, for each of you to answer, then we're gonna wrap it up. And before I do that, I wanna make sure I thank uh, Sachi and Thanuja for, uh, mostly Sachi, but Thanuja for backing up on organizing this of our first seminar. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, so I'm just wondering, and I think I know what the answer is for Fausto. Uh, how many preservation type techniques, what percentage of your dorsal hump reductions you're using one of these dorsal preservation techniques? So Miguel, how many, what's your percentage? Is everybody's getting a spare roof or? In the, in the primaries, yes. Okay. Anyway, there, it's very easy in the end. If you don't feel comfortable, just cut, fold, and suture. So my oldest technique was the component dorsal reduction. That's why I, I feel absolutely comfortable. And each time in primaries, in primaries, and for instance, today I, I did a tertiary that nothing was taken out. So it was all preserved. And I did, again, the spiral technique. So mm -hmm. I try always to do, and most of the times I do it. So. So my, no, real, no real contraindications for you. You try to do it in every patient if you can. Okay. Uh, Carlos. Oh, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, Sam. So if I do preservation, I do mainly this concept, uh, which I'm trying to push more and more and more and more. I used to do like 20 to 30%. I probably do today more than 50% of my cases with, with that. Okay. Uh, I still use cattle. I do it, I'm not saying often, but if I have big deviation, crooked noses, you know, this kind of V deviations of the whole structure, cattle is really great. Even if sometimes I feel that I lose control of how, how I can end with the profile. Uh, but then there are cases that you cannot use that. So you need to just understand what's the best indication for your technique. So I, I still do structural anaplasty, of course, dorsal structural anaplasty. Miguel, were you gonna say something? Did you wanna add something? I just wanted to say that, uh, well, big, big hamps with big, big deviations, that it's not usual. Uh, I can start with the spare roof technique and maybe I cannot end, maybe. It depends on it. But we are doing lots of crooked noses it's a very interesting concept. The nose goes as the septum goes. When you release the upper laterals from the septum, you have solved the aesthetic problem. So the nose goes straight. The septum is still crooked, but the nose is straight. The cartilaginous nose is straight. Then you have to deal with the bony part. It's not that difficult. You can do it like the oxel with the osteotomies in different shapes. It's not that easy. You still have the crooked septum, okay? But you don't have any more crooked nose. And it's very interesting. We are coming up with a, another paper uh, about, uh, we have about 40 patients, very interesting uh, long-term follow-up in the crooked septum and crooked noses with the spare technique. Then you have to, to, to choose. If it's really an important deviation, you can do extracorporeal. And it's very easy to do extracorporeal with this technique again or you just can leave it, or you, you have other different strategies, but uh, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Guxel, what percentage are you doing um, preservation? Preservation, almost 50% of my cases I do. Uh, let's divide two things, dorsum and septum, because uh, on the septum, I do high septal strip, I do Tetris, uh, several cases I did, and low septal strip I do, some mid septal strip, then uh, it depends on the case, it depends on the anatomy actually. If the nose is crooked, I prefer low septal strip. But sometimes I do Miguel's favorite with low septal strip. So uh, for me, it's different. I mean, I separated the septum and the dorsum work 
Uh, because of the indication, because of the anatomy, I combine these two things. So, uh, sometimes I do foundation techniques with uh, different septal approaches, but totally, almost 50% of my cases, I do preservation. Warren? What percentage? Yeah, I, I would say about the same, 50%. And for me, the decision is essentially, when I am doing a preservation, it's always endonasal. Uh, certainly, I'm, my eyes are opened up over the last couple of years watching guys who are external approach um, 